We're going to be in Genesis 32 tonight, transforming passage in Jacob's life. This is a pivotal moment in his life that's going to happen tonight. Genesis 32, beginning in verse 24. Genesis 32, 24 says this, Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak, and when he saw that he had not prevailed against him, that is, the man saw that he had not prevailed against Jacob, that man touched the socket of Jacob's thigh, so the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. And then he said, this is the man, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. That's what Jacob said. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men, and you have prevailed. And then Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. And so Jacob named the place Peniel, which means the face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been preserved. Now the sun rose upon him just as he crossed over Penuel, and he was limping on his thigh. He's, he's injured. Therefore, Moses writes here, to this day the sons of Israel do not eat the sinew of the hip, which is on the socket of the thigh, He's talking about animal flesh, obviously, because he, the angel, touched the socket of Jacob's thigh in the sinew of the hip. Let's pray. Father, we don't want to just know what happened here. We need to know that, but Lord, would you work here in this room? Would you bring us through some understanding that we need tonight for our lives right now? And Lord, you're going to apply this truth to us the rest of our lives at moments that are powerful. And I ask God that you give us ears to hear, clarity of mind, no distraction. But by your Holy Spirit, you would come teach us principles that will help us to surrender completely to you. Lord, we want our nature changed. We want to become like Jacob did, a man or a woman who is governed by God. So bless tonight as we study in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So I almost <clears throat> entitled this message, Touched by an Angel. <laughs> you know, I, I think when we think of like an angel, we get kind of excited. Can you imagine? You hear stories every once in a while. Somebody saw an angel or something that happened. You know, there are occasions when that has happened, not only in the Bible, but, but in, in people's lives who bear testimony to that. And we think, what a blessing it would be to just see one angel. Well, maybe. Um, Maybe. Uh, you, you need to remember something, though. The most common words that come out of an angel's mouth in the Bible. Anybody know what they are? Two words. Fear not. That should tell you something about angels showing up on you uh, uh, unaware. And even here, even though Jacob at first does not have a clue that this is an angel, we know it's an angel because of another passage that I'll share in just a minute. So take it by faith uh, in God's word that I'll share with you in a minute that this is no ordinary man. But it's an angel in the form of a man. Some believe it's the Lord Jesus Christ, but that's debatable. But let's learn something about angels. Jot down Hebrews 1 and verse 7. Hebrews 1 and verse 7, quoting the Old Testament there, says this. The writer of the Hebrews says, And of the angels, God says, He makes His angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. And they're both referring to angels. He's comparing angels to Jesus in Hebrews 1. His angels are winds, and his ministers a flame of fire. Well, that sounds powerful, but what do you get when you get winds and fire? You live in Southern California, right? Yeah, complete destruction is what you get when you put those two together. And the idea here is of the power of, of angels. And in fact, God is going to come through this angel that wrestles or fights with Jacob at this moment in his life. And literally all of his scheming to take on Esau, who's coming, remember, with how many men? A bunch, 400 men. Cavalry is coming with a vendetta. 20 years ago, he vowed he's going to kill him. And he had hoped 20 years, you know, he got over it. 
he appears to not have because he's coming evidently to kill him. And Jacob has no army, but all of his schemes, remember he's sending all these presents ahead, he's sending his family across, he's trying everything until he's all alone. Oh, he had a lot, but in this situation, God reduces him to just himself. And everything he had planned, all of his security is gone. I like the first verse, look at it again. Now is Jacob, or pardon me, verse 24, then Jacob was left alone. You might want to just circle the word alone. There are times in your life where God will, if he has to, take you out of how busy you are. He, he could do that a lot of different ways. He could put you in the hospital. I, I've had him do that to me before, where he wants to spend some time with you alone. He could cause your car to break down. He loves you enough to say, we need some time to, to talk. It might be a short time. It might be a longer time. You might not sense he's even involved in it. Someone once said, solitude is the audience chamber of God. Being alone is many times where God can speak to us. And really, for Jacob, who's terrified, he admits of meeting his brother for what that's going to mean for himself and his family. This is what you might call the dark night of the soul for him. Jacob is going to have a crisis of faith here on the bank of the Jabbok River, where he's left alone. By the way, it's interesting, when he met the Lord, he wasn't here in Penuel or Peniel, where was he that he met God? Bethel. Bethel. Well, it would become called Bethel, right? It was called Luz, but he renamed it Bethel. And by the way, all alone that night. Nobody with him at all. And sometimes that's when God can do his best work. Well, why don't you jot this down? Let it dawn on you that you are wrestling with God. Let it dawn on you. Why do I say that? Because the text says he was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. Now it's interesting, the words that are used in our text, because not long ago we read about what I call the baby wars between the two wives and the midwives. Remember when uh, Jacob has two wives and they're both trying to get his affection by having children, by having sons, by outbearing one another. And of course, uh, at this time, Rachel is now only born one son, Joseph, but through her handmaid, she had born several, and there was this competition going on, and we read this, uh, in fact, just jot it down, Genesis 30, verses 7 and 8, there's some familiar words here. Rachel's maid, Bilhah, conceived again and bore, a, bore Jacob a second son. Next slide. So Rachel said, with mighty wrestling, sound familiar? I have wrestled with my sister, and I have indeed prevailed. Both of those words are going to be used in our text tonight. And so she named him Naphtali, or one who wrestles. In other words, sometimes in our life, we're struggling with other people. Maybe it's people in your own family, like she was. Or maybe other people in God's family, and you've got a struggle going on. New Testament says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers in the high places, against demonic Forces. So we do know we can struggle with people. By the way, that's one of the attributes of a carnal Christian. Paul writes to the church at Corinth and he says, while you're striving with one another, are you not baby Christians? You're just acting like regular old people who struggle with everybody else, you know. But we do. We can wrestle with each other. We can wrestle certainly with demonic forces. But what is going on in this passage? Who is this man? How do we know? You know the Bible is the best commentary on the Bible, don't you? If you want to know what the Bible means, look for anywhere else where the Bible talks about the passage you're in. Hosea chapter 12 talks about our text. So let's take a look at verse 3 and 4, referring to Jacob. In the womb, he took his brother by the heel. By the way, that's why he got his name what? Yaakov, which means? Heel catcher. He, he, you know, he's a twin, not an identical twin, but one who grabbed his brother by the heel when he came out, and so they named him heel catcher, one who supplants, one who, who trips up somebody else, and that's going to be his character. He wept. Now we're in our text. The writer of Hosea is, or Hosea is writing about our text. He, Jacob, wept and sought his favor, the angel. He found him at Bethel, going back 20 years, and there he spoke with us. Is there another slide? That's all you got? That's all you got. Okay, just curious. Um, Hosea tells us that he actually wrestled with an angel. And so here's the reality that I want you to see tonight. That's why I've entitled the message, Wrestling with the Almighty. 
because Jacob did not know that he was wrestling with an angel. He did not know that he was rep- wrestling with a representative from God at all. Who do you think he assumed this was? Somebody from Esau's clan, somebody that was against him, some man in the night, some enemy that was willing to fight him. How terrifying that must have been. Remember in the New Testament when the apostles are arrested and they're trying to figure out what to do with them, that one of the Pharisees stands up, a wise, respected Pharisee by the name of Gamaliel. And Gamaliel tells the other Pharisees and Sadducees who are thinking about killing Peter and John, be careful what you do with these men. For if what they're preaching and what, if they're, what they're leading is just of men, hey, it'll, it'll peter out. You don't have to worry about it. He gives historical examples of other movements that have come and movements that have gone. You don't have to worry about it. If it's a man, no big deal. But he said, if this is from God, you might be found to even be fighting against God. And because of that counsel, they don't punish them. They don't kill them the way they had intended. Very interesting. Gamaliel gave wise counsel. It's possible that you're fighting God and you don't even know it. So here's where I want to start with you tonight. Is it possible right now in your life, someone or something you're struggling with, accepting or allowing or understanding that you're actually fighting God in it and you don't know it yet? It's very possible. And by the way, it happens more often than we think. So here's what I want you to put down. See how to receive the greater blessing of God. The greater blessing of God. We already know Jacob is a blessed man, but he's actually going to ask for and receive greater blessings tonight. I call this a close encounter of the right kind. The first truth, and this one's hard, but you got to write it down. If you want the blessing of God on your life, the full blessing of God, you need to realize God wants you broken for good. Broken for good. You say, I don't like it already. At Bethel, you might say Jacob got saved. Oh, he had heard of the Lord. His dad believed in the Lord. He had been brought up in a believing family. But at Bethel, Jacob met the Lord himself. At Bethel, he got saved. At Peniel, he gets sanctified. At Bethel, he got converted. At Peniel, he will become consecrated. May I say to you, some of you tonight can totally relate to that in your Christian life. That you were a believer in Jesus Christ for some time before you surrendered your entire life to the Lord. And you can look back and say, there was my Bethel. There was my Peniel. But some of you are here saying, only got a Bethel. Or maybe some of you are here going, I don't know what you're talking about, preacher. I don't have either of those. The Lord wants you to come to know him in saving faith. But for many of us, there's then a struggle with really allowing him to be who we invited him to be. What do I mean by that? That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as, what was it? Savior? Uh, No, it's not. You say, well, it's all kind of the same thing. Savior, Lord, no. That he he has died on the cross for my sin, risen from the dead. He's my hope of heaven and forgiveness of sins. People want to take advantage of that. But that if you'll confess with your mouth, Jesus says, Hakurios, supreme master of my life. Jesus said, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Are you a disciple of Jesus? Have you decided that you won't hold on to your life? Or are you saying, Lord, I don't want to go to hell when I die. I I want all the benefits, but I'm not sure about the cost of becoming your follower like that. Well, interesting that the Lord sends an angel to wrestle with Jacob. Now, here's a good question. Why would God want to wrestle with us? Let me ask you, why do you think God would want to wrestle with us? Why would he want to wrestle with Jacob? Yeah. To humble us. That's certainly going to happen here. Yeah. To break our will. It's going to happen. Anybody else? Yeah. For us to see how weak we really are, because he already knows, right? It's like, you ever arm wrestled? I know a lot of us haven't, but with (laughs) some of us have. Arm wrestled, and and you were in it with somebody, and then you realized, oh, they're messing with me. Or you were messing with them. It's like, oh, bam. You know, obviously, we have a a, a mismatch here. 
So it's not that God needs to see how weak Jacob is, but Jacob needs to see that. What, anybody else? Why? To strengthen us, okay, and change us. Anybody else? Why would God want to wrestle? Yeah. To get to the end of your strength. That's certainly what is going to happen in our text. You know, I have, um, I have three sons. I've never had daughters. And uh, I, God knew he wouldn't give me a daughter because I would have walked down the aisle to present her, you know, to get married. And I would have gotten about halfway and said, this isn't happening. And I would have taken her out. So he said, you can't, can't trust you with that. So three sons and uh, two grandsons. And uh, while I probably did more of it when I was younger, I still like wrestling with my my. My grandsons. I don't like wrestling with my sons anymore, but with my, with my grandsons. But I used to wrestle with Christian all the time. We'd, we'd have little fights on the way to school. We'd slap each other just for fun, you know, just to mess around with each other. It was just kind of the way we were. Um, but, but I do that even with little Jeffrey. He's only one year old. He can't wrestle much, you know, so I always win. It's really nice. Um, <laughs> but why do I like to wrestle with him? I, I'm going to give you a word. You might just want to jot this down. Why does God make you wrestle with him? Ready for the word? Intimacy intimacy. You see, when I wrestle with my sons, we're close, very close. And here's another thing that happens when I wrestle with my son or my grandson. Uh, There's some things that they discover about me. They discover, one, that I'm stronger than them. That's why I don't wrestle with my sons anymore. I wrestle with my grandson. I'm much, much stronger than him. He didn't stand a chance. And I sometimes will fake him out. He'll think I'm going to rock one way and I'll rock another way. And so he's kind of surprised. But he'll learn, I'm never going to hurt him. I'm never going to injure him. But I'll protect him because I love him. Listen, God doesn't wrestle with you because he's mad at you or he's going to punish you. But God wants to wrestle with you to get you to a place he wants you to be. Here's the reality, and we see it in our text. The greater blessing of God, let me say it twice, the greater blessing of God comes in his breakings in our life and in his breaking down of our will. The psalmist says, the nearest, or pardon me, the nearness of God is my good. And I see God saying, I want to wrestle with Jacob tonight. Jot it down, Psalm 119, verse 67. The psalmist says, before I was afflicted, (laughs) I went astray, but now I keep your word. God, you're using pain in my life to get me where you want me to be. And when I wrestle just like I do with my sons, I get closer. He discovers things. So Jacob is going to discover some things about the Lord tonight in this text. So if you're going through a hard time with God, you don't know why God is not allowing it. By the way, Job struggled with the Lord. You're in good company. At the end, God had to say to him, you are a fault finder, but you're contending with the Almighty. You're never going to win this battle, but you can win if you'll surrender. Interesting, what happens is Jacob's hip is dislocated. Now, From what I can see in the text, it's pretty severe. Think about this. Why would God want to actually dislocate, maybe even most Bible teachers believe he was not just wounded, but crippled for life? And I'll show you why we think that in a minute. Jacob's hip is dislocated. Here's something to think about. After this, Jacob is now no longer to do What he's always relied on, run. He is a good runner. 20 years before, he ran from the consequences with Esau. He's gone through a lot. A few days before this, he's running from somebody else, Laban. Have you noticed? That's the way he handles life. Just run. I run. And God's going to say, enough. Enough. No more running from you or for you and no running from me. You've all heard of that shepherd who has that rebellious sheep who just, no matter what he does, he goes and he gets him, he's in danger, he pulls him back, he wanders away and he brings him back repeatedly until finally he has to take severe action and he'll break the leg of that wandering sheep 
They say that the, the shepherd would put that sheep actually on his shoulders to lead the other sheep. They have to go. That little sheep can't walk anymore. It's got a broken leg. It's being mended. It's going to take weeks or months. And during that time, that little rebellious sheep will get super close to that shepherd and have a relationship even different than the rest of the sheep. And when it's healed, it'll never stray again. God will use pain in our life, not just to get our attention, but many times to actually change who we are. I love that about Jacob. He is going to be broken tonight. But here's the reality. You say, I want to be blessed of God, so do I. But what if he told you, to bless you, I have to break you? How many stay on that sign-up sheet? It's going to hurt. I will bless you, but I must break you. You see, Jacob had desires just like all of us do as well. But quite often, what we're praying for, what we want, isn't what's best for us, and we just don't know it. Listen to this. This was a prayer written out that was found in the pocket of a Civil War soldier that was shot and killed at Gettysburg. He wrote this. I asked for strength that I might achieve. God made me weak that I might obey. I asked for health that I might do great things. He gave me grace that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy, but he gave me poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men he gave me weakness that I might feel a need for God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. He gave me life that I might enjoy all things. I received nothing that I asked for. He gave me everything that I had hoped for. And so it is that Jacob, who is terrified of Esau, actually has some bigger business to deal with than he even knows. And by the way, I find that often to be the case. Quite often, God will allow conflict or problems. It might be health, it might be family, it might be relationships, it often is. It might be personal struggles, it might be financial. And we are all focused on these big problems and our bigger problem that has to do with our relationship with the Lord. We're not even focused there. But God will take us from that conflict that we're in and get our eyes off of the conflict onto himself and change us for good. I love that. So God breaks things to bless them. What does the Bible say? Jesus broke the bread and he blessed it. He broke the bread and he blessed it. That woman took that alabaster box of expensive spikenard. She broke it that she might bless the Lord. Jesus said, this is my body broken for you. Jot down Matthew 21 and verse 44, thinking about breaking and how it's God's will. Listen to this verse. Jesus says he's the stone the builders have rejected. He's become the chief cornerstone. And then he says this interesting statement. He who falls on this stone, referring to himself. He who falls on this stone will be what? Broken to pieces. Well, that sounds horrible. Well, here's the alternative. On whomever the stone falls, it'll scatter him like dust. And you're going, is there a third option? Nope, it's just those two. Judgment, the stone is either going to judge you or best case scenario, the only thing really that you want, fall on him and be broken to pieces. You say, that doesn't sound fun. No, it doesn't. But it's exactly what God intends for us to be. Broken. What does Paul say in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians? We are like earthenware vessels. What did God make Adam out of? Dirt out of the dust of the earth, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. You're dirt, no offense, so am I. <laughs> Shouldn't look down on dirt, it's just us, right? <laughs> My sons, we used to say, your hands are dirty, We're, it's time to eat, you need to wash. They say, hey, God made dirt and dirt don't hurt. That was one of their lines. <laughs> yeah, go wash. Anyway, but you and I are simply, the ingredients of what we are, dirt. And I love the fact that Paul says, God knows that. He knows your frame, that you're but dust. He knows your limitations, but God has purposed to put his glory, the glory of the gospel and the life of Christ into clay pots, into earthenware vessels, into your life. You are fragile. You have flaws. You break easily. 
But good news, we're not preaching ourselves. <laughs> when we break, it's an opportunity for the light to shine. Just think Gideon <laughs> and those clay pots and the torches that shine when they were broken. The breaking is the opportunity for the glory of God to go right through your life. It's when you are hurting the most. What did God say to Paul who wanted the thorn in the flesh removed? I got something better. I'm going to leave it right where it is because I'm going to accomplish something that otherwise would never happen if I took it away. What if what you or I are praying so hard for God changes, God changes, and he says, I, wanna, I love you too much. I have something better for your life and for your witness if I don't. I know we don't like to hear it, but if we trust God, we'll accept it. Now, if you want the great blessing of God in your life, you have to ask him for it. Put this down. Cry out to the Lord for his blessing. Look at verse 26. After his hip is dislocated, then he said, let me go. Now, he's fighting one moment, and the next moment, the angel is saying to Jacob, let me go. The dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Something has happened between verse 25 and 26. They are literally in a contest. It appears for their life. Jacob's not winning. The, the angel reaches out and simply touches him. And some realization must have come over Jacob. This is not Esau's guy. He's wounded. He's broken. He's defeated. Suddenly, he knows it's the presence of God, and now he's hanging on for dear life. And the angel says, got to go. And Jacob says, oh, I'll let you go. I now realize who you are. I, you're, you're an angel of God. You're from God. I need your blessing on my life. I need your power in my life. Jacob here in this moment is broken, but he is not beaten. I don't know what I mean by that. Paul the Apostle says we are cast down, but we're not destroyed. Yes, we get tossed around in this life, but God only allows that that he might accomplish something better. And here we see Jacob holding on to the Lord and asking him for his blessing. Do you ever ask God to bless you? Do you feel guilty asking? Jacob says, I won't let you go unless you bless me. It's interesting. He has a dislocated hip. Here's what I don't hear him saying. He doesn't say, God, please heal me. Now, see, I would have been saying, could you put that back together? You really messed it up real quick. I mean, can Malchus, the ear thing, could you could reverse it? Not a word about healing. Isn't that interesting? I don't want you to heal me. I want you to bless me. Here's my suggestion. Bless me in and through the brokenness that you clearly willed into my life. Victory for us as believers in this life. And the blessing of God comes through insistent prayer and persistent prayer. And by the way, Hosea is talking about Jacob as praying to God and crying and weeping and suppliant. I won't let you go unless you bless me. Now, there's a part of me that when I read that, I think, what nerve? What, bless my life? Can we just remember that Jacob, just a few verses earlier in this chapter, look at verse 10. Just a few minutes ago, as it were, 32.10, he said, I am unworthy of all the loving kindness and all of the faithfulness which you have shown to your servant, for with my staff only I crossed this Jordan, now I've become two companies. He has just bragged to God of how he is cup overflows, he has everything, he has wives, he has kids, he has money, he has flocks, and he has the nerve to say, ah, uh, more blessing. Really? I mean, I'm shocked that the angel didn't dislocate the other hip. I mean, it seems over the top. But what if, what if Jacob understands that there's a blessing from God that'll never come in a paycheck, that'll never come in the cars you drive, that'll never be registered in terms of your, your estate's value, that can't be registered even in the people that you love, that you count so dear, and all the blessings that have to do with people and stuff. What if there's a blessing beyond that that God has for you? Bless me. 
I'm not talking about more stuff. I'm not even talking about more people. I'm talking about a blessing that only comes from you. What did James say? You have not because what? You ask not. See, Jacob knew the promise of God on his life. Not only had he met the Lord back at Bethel, but his own father had pronounced a blessing on his life. God's going to bless you, son. You, you, radical blessing. God himself wants to bless you. You know, it's, it's interesting. We, we might read the Wall Street Journal to know how we should invest our money wisely. Or you might read, you know, good housekeeping to know how to make your home a nice place to be. Or good parenting to know how to take care of kids. Nothing wrong with that. But why is it we fail to read the book that gives us God's promises on how the blessing of God might come on our life. You see, when Jacob said, bless me, I won't let you go unless you bless me, he's holding God to the promise that he has already made in his life. You know, George Mueller of Bristol was a man of great faith. If you've ever studied anything about him, you know that he had a heart for orphans. And he literally prayed millions of, of English pounds into the ministry and trusted God incredibly. But here's what George Mueller of Bristol said, quote, I take the promises of the word and I argue with the Lord. Not in order to convince God, but in order to convince myself. In other words, I pray to God the promises that he's made to remind me and to give me faith to keep asking him for it. You know, I think God is looking to bless people Remember how that passage says the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the whole earth looking for someone to show himself strong on their behalf whose heart is totally his. What, I, I think about it, what does that mean? God's looking for someone, if you think about it, I'll paraphrase it, to bless, to use, whose heart is totally his, no self-will, and who wants to trust him for a new work of blessing in their life so that he might use them in a greater way. What if this is true? God is looking for people, listen to me now, who will not take no for an answer from God prematurely. Let me say that again. What if God is looking for someone who won't take no prematurely as an answer from God? You say, what do you mean? Jot it down. Matthew 15, verses 25 through 28. Matthew 15, 25. Syrophoenician woman came and began to bow down before Jesus, saying, Lord, help me. He said, hey, it's not good to take the children's bread, throw it to the dogs. Next slide. But she said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, "O woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. When she first comes up, Jesus, asking for Jesus' help, if you read the text, he ignores her. He doesn't even answer her. She's not a Jew. He's only been sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Completely ignores her. Seems very almost like, what, Lord? God, Jesus, you're Jesus. It would be nice to. And when he does speak, he says that. The answer is no. Doesn't, that blessing doesn't belong to you. But he ministers to her. Do we really think he didn't want to and she kind of, convinced him to do so. How about in the Old Testament? Let, let, me, let me give you a different one. Uh, children of Israel have sinned, take any one of the uh, many times they did that, and God says, Moses, stand back. I am going to obliterate the nation of Israel. In fact, I'll start a new nation. We'll call it the Mosesites. Remember when God does one of those? And what does Moses say? Yeah, he basically says, God, I don't think that's a good idea at all. <laughs> Not that I wouldn't like the name, but, you, you know, people are watching. It almost sounds like Moses saying, calm down, God. <laughs> and he intercedes. Do you not know that God is giving Moses an opportunity to be like Christ? To say, destroy me. Listen to me. God had no intention of not fulfilling his promises to his people. But God is working on Moses. Luke 24, Jesus is on the road to Emmaus with two guys who are 
sorrowful because Messiah Jesus of Nazareth has died. They don't know it's Jesus who's walking with them. He's very much alive. And as they are coming, he's been sharing from the word of God with them, from the Old Testament, about all the things the Old Testament said Messiah must do, including suffer and die. And they didn't get all those passages together. They didn't understand the Messiah had to die to enter his glory. And so Jesus is bringing them through the great Bible study. We know because later they'll say, did not our hearts burn within us when he spoke to us the word of God along the way. But he's doing that, and the Bible says they come to the village where the two men were going, to Emmaus. And then there's this interesting little part that says, and Jesus made it look as though he was going to go farther. In other words, see you guys. Now wait a minute. Did Jesus really want to go farther? Or was he going to wait for them to say, hey, 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 we, can we finish that Bible study over communion or, you know, dinner? I don't know. All I know is Jesus appears to be doing something. He's giving them an opportunity to respond. Here's what I want you to know. There are times God is apparently, it looks like, ignoring us when he's not. The question is, what do you do when God seems to say no? Do you keep knocking at the door? Or do you go, oh, I don't want to bug you anymore, God, on that. I asked you once or twice. Fascinating to me. I will not let you go until you bless me. The Bible says... Jesus said it. Seek, keep seeking, you'll find. Knock, don't stop till the door's open. Ask and keep asking. And then if you want the blessing of God in your life, put this down. Confess who you really are. Verse 27 is an interesting verse. When he said, I won't let you go until you bless me, here's how the Lord responds. So he said to him, what is your name? Now, look, the Lord knows his name. Jacob knows his name. He's going to say, Jacob, what is going on here? Just this. If God is going to have all of your life, you're going to have to be very honest about who you are. Jacob's going to get a new name in a moment. In this verse, changing, transformative moment in his life. But to get there, he's got to start with who he is. And by the way, this should bring back a memory for Jacob, because the last time he was being asked who he was was when his own dad, who was going blind, said, who are you, son? Are you Esau? Remember when he tricked his father? And so God uses very similar words. What is your name? He wants him to say it. I want you to say it. I am Jacob. Because you see, he had said he was Esau that night. There's a lot of people who don't want to be who they are. Jake, I want Esau's blessings. <laughs> I want what he, I'm jealous of him, I'm jealous of her. I want what, you know, I've always said that for Christians, a lot of times the gifts are always greener on the other brother. Oh, I wish I could sing. If I could just sing like that, man, I, could, I would love it. Maybe. Maybe that person is singing is looking at something with you and go, I wish my hair was straight. <laughs> or I wish I was kind like that or funny. You, you don't know, but that when you say you want to be somebody else, something is wrong. You're not accepting who God has made you. And God is going to change not only Jacob's name, he's going to change his nature tonight. What does the Bible say? If any man is in Christ, he's what? New creation. Jacob will never be Jacob again after this night. He is going through a change. So he's reminding him of his past, and he's wanting him to be honest about his past. And God is bringing him right back to an area that he has to get right. If you or I want God to have all that we are, to become all that he intends us to be, we have to start by admitting we're not that now. And we have never been that. Then put this down. Become one known to be governed by God. In verse 28. He said your name. And you could just write into that word name nature. Because that's the idea. Your nature. Your name will no longer be. Someone who's ripping other people off. But instead. Yisrael. Literally. Israel. 
For you have contended or striven, wrestled with God and with men, and you have prevailed. Hmm. It's interesting. Here we see Jacob. He had been fighting God and now broken. He's just holding on to the Lord. I won't let you go. Jot down Psalm 63 and verse 8. Psalm 63, verse 8. David said, my soul clings to you. And your right hand upholds me. Martin Luther's wife was Catherine. Catherine's dying words were, I will cling to Christ like a burr to a top coat. <laughs> I am going to hold on to him. What did Job say? Though he slay me, yet shall I hope in him. If I'm going out, I don't understand why God has allowed all the hurt and suffering in my life, my body. But if I'm going to die, I'm going to go out trusting, holding on to him, you see. And so he gets a new name, a name that could be translated governed by God. That's what it means to be consecrated to the Lord. You're no longer saying, Lord, would you help me with this? Would you help me with that? I just, I'm trying to do this. Or I'm trying to figure it out myself. You're saying, God, I just want to discover what your will is. I am now your servant. I am your disciple. I, I like to say disciples don't make decisions. They make discoveries. I'm not deciding what I'm going to do. Why? Because my life is not my own. I'm going to say, Lord, what do you want from my life? And when I get back to trying to run it myself, Lord, I'm going to repent of that. New name. Governed by God. Quite a name. Quite a claim. Can you imagine being an atheist and having the name Christian? <laughs> well, there are some, I'm sure. Parents named you Christian. Maybe they liked the sound of it. Maybe they were believers. Who knows? Maybe they prayed over their kid, but I'm an atheist. Something in conflict there. Let me ask you, who else gets a new name in the Bible? Abraham, Abraham becomes Abraham. Sarah, Sarai becomes Sarah. Peter, whose name was formerly Simon or Cephas, becomes Peter. Saul uses, we don't have God changing his name, but he changes it to Paul, which means little. Anybody else? Hosea becomes Joshua. Moses gives him a new name. Joseph, in the book of Acts, becomes Barnabas, which means... Son of encouragement. There are a lot of examples of people who God or men change their name. And in every case, when it comes to believers, it's always for the better. You don't ever get a worse name like, ah, you're annoying. I'm calling you annoying from now on. You know, and there's none of that in Scripture. And I was thinking about this because the Bible teaches that that's exactly going to be true for us as God's people. Jot down Isaiah 62.2. The nations will see your righteousness and all kings your glory. And you will be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord will designate. And there in Revelation, the church of Jesus Christ, the believers are given a new name. I think of Jabez in the Old Testament. You know what Jabez's name means? It means grief. Grief and sorrow. And his mother named him that because with sorrow she bore him. So how would you like your name to be a pain? You know, hey, Payne, come over here. Yeah, you are that, you know. Live up your name. Of course, you're doing that again. <laughs> um, Pigpen. I was like a name like Pigpen and Charlie Brown. It's pretty obvious what you are bringing into the, you, know, you bring your own environment with you. Jabez said, God, I want you to bless me. He, like Jacob, said, I want you to bless me. I don't want to bring, I don't want to be a, a, a messenger of pain. I don't want more pain. I, I want your blessing on my life that I might bring you honor. That's what it means, I think, to come to know Jesus Christ, to say, Lord, in myself, in my flesh, I am a Jacob, and I have brought a lot of hurt to other people. Change my nature. Change my name, Lord. I want my new name. I want to be governed by God. And then put this down. Uh, seek to singularly know God better. You want the blessing of God on your life? Then make this your singular request. Look at verse 29 and 30. Then Jacob asked him, 
he's asking the angel. Very interesting. The angel says, what's your name? And so it's kind of like, well, if we're playing the name game, <laughs> what's yours? I didn't see your name tag to the angel. Jacob asked him and said, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him right there. Now, this is interesting to me. Why do you want to know someone's name? Know what to call them? Biblically, why do you want to know someone's name? Let me ask you, what is revealed in the names of God? His attributes, his character. We could sit here and for the next 10 minutes so we don't have much more time than that to be together. We could start reciting names of Jesus and names of God. It's always encouraging to discuss. He is Emmanuel. He is El Shaddai. He is El El Yon. And we go through the names and we're encouraged to remember, yes, his multiple attributes and assets. The beauty of the Lord is revealed in his name the righteous run into the name of the Lord and they're safe, you see. Because he's a rock, he's a refuge, he's a fortress. When Jacob is asking the name of the one who represents the Lord, please may I suggest to you what's going on in his life as he's broken, he's holding on to the Lord, if you will, and he's saying, I want to know you. I want to know you better. Is that not what Paul the Apostle said? The desire of his life was in Philippians 3. I forget what lies behind and I press forward for the upward call of God in Jesus Christ that I may know him. That I may know him and the power of the resurrection, the fellowship of his heart. I want to know him. What did Jeremiah, God said through Jeremiah, don't boast about your money or your muscles or your PhD and your brains. Let him who boasts, boast in this, that he knows and understands me. And I see already in Jacob, there's this passion to know God better. Hmm. Interesting. By the way, something I just want you to notice in passing here is you know who's never mentioned even once in this text? Esau. This was all about Esau. Esau. This, this fear in him was all about this thing. It's about to happen the next day. Esau's coming. Oh, that was three dog night. Sorry. Esau's coming and he's terrified. And suddenly, Esau's not even relevant to the story anymore. By the way, remember when Elijah wanted to die? You remember that? It was right after the great victory on Mount Carmel and the victory over the prophets and all that, and the fire fell, and it was a great mountaintop experience, literally. But then he finds out Jezebel is upset that he killed all her prophets. I can understand that. But she has put out a hit on Elijah. You're dead. You're as dead as my prophets. It's just a matter of time. I'm wiping you out. And Elijah freaks out. He's ready to stand up all the prophets of Baal and Baal himself. And God, it's amazing. But this woman Jezebel is like, ah! Reminds me of Peter at the campfire, by the way. I'll fight the soldiers, but those little campfire girls, ah! He has trouble. But anyway, <laughs> Elijah runs, goes south, past Beersheba, past the border, outside of Jezebel's jurisdiction, sits down under a tree and says, I want to go home. I hate this life. I've stood for you. And I, he's moping. He's, he wants to die. He says, God, kill me. God says, let's talk. My place, Mount Horeb. You know what's interesting? When Elijah gets there, go read the text. Not one mention of Jezebel. Not one mention of the fact that she's threatened to kill. He's just out there to kill. It's irrelevant. What he needs is a face-to-face -face with God. And when that happens, it just isn't at issue anymore, what Jezebel was threatening. By the way, very similar to this, the book of Job. Job, through the whole book, wants to meet with God to understand, why are you allowing these things to happen to me? I haven't done anything wrong. You took my children. You took my wealth. You took my reputation. You took my health. He, I did. Let's go to court. I want to talk to God. Until God shows up. And it's like, you know what? I, I'm good. <laughs> it's amazing. What you need is not a solution to that conflict and that problem in your life. What you need is a face-to-face -face encounter with God. And when that happens, those other things, well, they just, who cares about Queen Jezebel or Esau come and let him take, I am not worried about it. I just saw the Lord face to face. I managed to come alive through that. You can't see God's face and live, but I just did. 
and he is ready for whatever God has for him. Then walk step by step in utter dependence. Verse 31. Now the sun rose upon Jacob just as he crossed over Penuel, and he was limping on his thigh. Now this is why this is important to me. We, I told you he has years, still about 40 some years to live, a bunch of chapters still about his life. But something happens to him here and he's limping away from this encounter with God. He is wounded. I believe he's crippled for life. And he's limping on his staff. Jot down Hebrews 11.21. We talk about living by faith, not as much about dying by faith, but the Bible does. What does it mean to die in faith? Hebrews 11 and verse 21. We have that one, guys? There it is. By faith, Jacob, as he was dying, <laughs> here's a guy who's about to die in faith, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, what's that next phrase say? He was leaning on his staff. Don't just picture this little ornament that he carried around with him. He didn't carry a cane any more than you would for nothing. He is leaning on his staff the day that he dies, and from this day to that day, every single step, he had to lean on that staff. Why? Because God has taught him that in his brokenness, he cannot depend on himself anymore. And God wants to break that in you and break that in me too, to say, Lord, I don't trust me anymore. I rather am going to rely upon you. Very interesting. Especially when 20 years earlier, when he met the Lord at Bethel, the Hebrew text tells us Jacob got up, and the Hebrew kind of, it's like he's met the Lord, and he's heading now for Haran. He was running, he was worried, he was tired, but he wakes up after meeting the Lord at Bethel, and it's kind of like Jacob wakes up with happy feet. That's really the idea of the Hebrew. He is energized. But at Peniel, <laughs> it's not happy feet anymore. The spring in his step is gone. In fact, he has a limp for the rest of his life. Listen, the Bible says in Isaiah 53, Jesus Christ was wounded for our transgressions. May I suggest to you, God will wound us in order for us to learn our lessons. There are things we can only learn through God allowing pain to come into our life. And here's what basically Jacob learned. If I don't trust in the Lord, if I don't depend on him, I'll fall flat on my face. And now I, I know that. And finally, verse 32, put this down. See where your life's legacy is. Because verse 32, suddenly we come out of the time that we're in. And Moses is now writing centuries later about what happened. Because Jacob was wounded or crippled in his socket. He tells us how the children of Israel throughout these ages have taken that truth. And here's the idea. What God touches becomes holy. He touched Jacob in the thigh, and now to honor that, verse 32, therefore to this day the sons of Israel do not eat the sinew of the hip which is on the socket of the thigh, because God touched through the angel the socket of Jacob's thigh and the sinew of the hip. Somebody shared a book with me once called Halftime. Interesting concept. I, I, I think a lot of us in this room would be able to relate to it. They said... The first half of your life, your goal, especially if you're a man, is success. You want to be successful. You want to provide for your family. You want to get ahead in your career, success. But there comes a point in your life, it's not always halfway through, but there comes a point when you stop thinking so much about success and your goal instead is significance. And the question is, what will my life have meant to anyone? What will it have meant to my family, my children, my friends, to the church? What, what, Here's what you want to remember. Whatever God touches in your life becomes holy. Jacob's sons would be able to make this statement. My dad limped through life, but he learned to lean on the Lord. He, he, he limped the rest of his life. He had shortcomings. He had physical, but, but he, he trusted in God. Interesting. Jesus touches the bread and he breaks it. And only then, if you read the text where he fed the 5,000, does he use it to bless other people. He touches it, he breaks it, and then he gives it as a blessing to other people. What if your legacy, what if what you have to leave behind you isn't 
the amount of money you make or your, your accomplishments at work or, or in life? What if it's none of that? What if it's the way you limp? What if it's where God has touched you and by touching you, you have accepted his lordship in your life and it's broken you, but while you limp in that area, you lean on the Lord in such a way that people will never forget that about you. Oh, yeah, they weren't perfect. They, they had their shortcomings. They had their struggles. But they totally relied on the Lord, step by step, day by day. They gave up running from the Lord to learn to walk and depend. On behalf of our pastors and staff, we want to thank you for tuning in to today's video. If you want to stay informed about what's going on here at Calvary Chapel East Anaheim, we'd love for you to subscribe to our channel. Go ahead and do so by clicking the button below. We'll see you next time.